Globus. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Are you happy with this conference? Yes? Yes? <laughs> um, I, um, this is technology and happiness session. It is too big and too abstract. <laughs> so um, I just picked up five points um, to just a kind of a starting point of the discussion that is shown on the slide. Five changes that will be driven by the technology, but quite relevant with our happiness. The first one is how we work. Because of the AI, what is required of the human in work and how we enjoy our work will be quite different based on those technologies and how the concept of work and how the concept of enjoyment in work and how to be happier and productive in workplace in this area. That's one, the first one. The second one, the relationship with 5G or AR, VR. Our relationship with uh, online and offline merge and that inevitably leads to change in communication, relationship, community, organization. That how we make this community and our organization happier and happy place. And the third one is liberty. Every data, even in this room, uh, every behavior of our you know, so, uh, everyday life will be in data and collected and analyzed by somebody. And that might limit our liberty of freedom and may invade our privacy. So how we recognize the concept of happiness in this new constraint. The fourth one, equality. Somebody who has more data, um, some have less data, has tremendous impact on how much wealth you have. So. Um, we might be entering into the era of disparity in wealth. Um, but we might, of course, that's based on our decision. And that's the fourth one. The fifth one is lifespan. We might, you know, many of the people here will live up to approximately 100 years, years old. And... Uh, that will inevitably change our concept of happiness and how we make our life happier. So, um, I'd like to ask these three distinguished panelists, pick one of them and <laughs> one of them and uh, give some comments or thoughts or answers to one of those, those um, issues and uh, be the first, Shimada-san. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yano san Hello, everyone. Hello. Are you happy? Yeah. Good. I'm happy. Um, first of all, yes, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, when I uh, learned that I, I was invited to this um, panel, uh, especially the topic is tech and happiness. Happiness is one of the um, center core topic for me for for my life as well as for the last uh, especially one to two years uh, because I'm now really really putting myself um, into the area of positive psychology so um, I'm now trying to learn a lot of things from the field as well as trying to utilize the learning from the positive psychology happiness into my management as well as uh, running the company so, um, in order for me to um, pick up uh, one of the five, um, for me, like, it's very difficult because each topic are interrelated each other. But um, if I say, because Ataka-san says he's going to pick up a work, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm Japanese. I'm, I, um, you know, give it him to the topic he wants to speak. So, maybe I will go with the relationships. Mm. Um, 
basically, I think um, um, technology is a um, happy thing, uh, especially, I think, a tech, uh, including AI, is uh, existing to make us happier. Because for me, it means that I, myself, we are, as a human being, can focusing only on what we can do. So technology, AI can do any other things, but uh, uh, emotions, feelings, those kind of things, these, these are the only thing that the human beings can do. So from that perspective, I'm very happy. I'm very um, eager to uh, welcome the, all any technologies that comes to my field uh, and then uh, you know, management. So relationship, yes, it uh, changes a lot uh, in a better way for me, uh, I think. Uh, for example, this morning, up until now I come here, I joined the wedding ceremony of my team member. Um, yeah, it, it was a very happy thing. And then um, in the ceremony, uh, she is a millennial. So she utilized the technology for her uh, wedding ceremony. And then that was amazing. And then I realized that, huh, wedding ceremony also changes the way that makes the participants much happier, right? And then based on, thanks to the technology, what I also found was shinpu gawa, shinro gawa, which means a, a bride and then, nan, nan you know? Groom. So there are always the two big groups, but due to the technology, both sides has much more, uh, you know, easier conversation we made and then much easier for us to speak each other. So relationships, yes, it's improving. That's my view. Okay. Any comment from other panelists? I <laughs> know. <laughs> 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 in terms of relationship, what I'm thinking is, as depicted in, did you see the movie Ready Player One? So, yeah, as depicted in that movie, probably we will decide when to jack into the network or not. That's the future of our, uh, our relationship, probably, rather than who to date or who to meet, rather than that, you know, we will decide when to check in. And probably how to manage the frequency of the jacking into the network determines their happiness. At least I am now, and I am being so much kind of contaminated with the Twitter and the Facebook and the many, many, many connections. I feel so much I'm happy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> too many informations, too many connections. So we have to manage that. That's the thing I'm feeling about that. Okay. So, Sheena, um, can you give us your thought or decision or choose <laughs> out of choosing? Anything about happiness? So, if you think about the biggest revolution that's happened in the last, say, 50 years. Essentially, you've had two types of revolutions, the choice revolution and the information revolution, and certainly technology has aided in that. So you have, um, not only do you have uh, exponential growth in the number of choices that you have in the grocery stores on Amazon, which is over 300 million options now, Starbucks, 84,000 different drink combinations. Walmart has over a million products. And these are just normal types of things. You know, what you eat, what you wear, uh, what books you might read. If you go to things like online dating, there's right now 5,000 different online dating sites worldwide, 2,500 of which are just there in the United States. Um, if you look at the amount of information that we are consuming today, um, it's been estimated that people in developed countries, working individuals in developed countries, the amount of information coming at them consciously and subconsciously is the equivalent of reading 174 newspapers per day. So we do have a lot of choice. We do have a lot of information. And that is both a pro and a con across all of these things, right, in the sense that Look, if you, we, we all see ourselves and our children get addicted to technology. We're, we're addicted to checking our cell phone. 
You know, we check our cell phones an average of 50 times a day to see the texts. We are all addicted to checking our emails, to Googling something, right? And on the one hand, that's a really positive thing, right? Because we no longer have to rely on our memory banks. We could just look it up. Mm -hmm. um, we can get access to information at our fingertips, which can make us, you know, more right. productive at work. But at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's sometimes we be, it becomes really hard for us to pay attention to what's around us. Mm -hmm. So, for, for example, I, I don't know what the situation here is in Japan, but in the United States, it is common for parents to literally put controls. Like, I, I literally put, like, you know how we, we worry about our children having addiction to um, drugs? Well, you know, the new drug is, is TikTok <laughs> and Snapchat. And so literally, in the beginning of this past summer, yeah. I remember looking at my son's phone, because I have control over his phone. And, uh, <laughs> and it was like the end of June. He spent 50 hours that week just on TikTok. Oh, 50 hours. Just on TikTok. Wow. I was like, what are you, crazy? This is like how much time people spend on a full-time job. And this is TikTok. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you, it was a real struggle. There were times when I, I, I controlled it. I reduced his hours on it. And then at one point, he, he managed to trick me, and he got the passcode. And so then, lo and behold, he was back on this addiction. So then I had to figure out a passcode where he couldn't break it. And so by the end of July, I finally had a passcode, which he couldn't break. And so now, yes, he's down to... 90 minutes a day of full phone usage, right? So beyond 90 minutes, anything he might want to use other than, you know, making a call to his mom, um, <laughs> essentially gets killed, right? But that's just an example of how, on the one hand, it's amazing, right? It's amazing. I can reach my son no matter where I am in the world, and I can track him. I can, I can have Life 360 thing, you know that app? I can literally track when he got to school. It was like in the old days, my mom had to rely on the fact that maybe I made it to school and I was still alive. Really, the only time she saw me was at 7 in the morning and then again at 6 or 6.30 when she came home. Today, any time in the day, I can just turn on my phone and I know exactly where my kid is, mm -hmm. including knowing that he's playing hooky and went off to the, to the little store next to his school to get lunch there instead of in his cafeteria. So that's one case where, again, it's a trade-off, right, between the positive and the negative of that. And I could probably go through hundreds of these ways in which um, technology is doing exactly that. Um, do I have time to maybe tell them one study? Yeah. All right, so I'll tell you one study that I currently have in under review right now with um, um, uh, uh, PNAS, which is a journal that's uh, like science. Um, and so... You know, we often, we often talk about how uh, things like Facebook and Instagram make us really, really fake. And, 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 you know, there's lots of examples online where we can really be fake. I mean, you know, some of you have probably heard of that, uh, that, that new um, way in which you can go on Instagram and act as you can pay to look like you were on a private jet. And the whole thing is completely fake and curated to all your friends, you know, think you're on a private jet, but really you're not. And so, so we can do some stuff that's really, really curated. And so you could argue that this ability to become completely fake selves and have completely fake lives in many ways has some pretty negative effects. And it probably does have some pretty serious negative effects on our own self-esteem. It has <coughs> negative effects when we look at other people and the only thing we're seeing is the fact that they're always in some cool place doing some cool thing eating some cool whatever's right um, one of the questions that my PhD student is studying who's a uh, somebody who's specializing in studying the effects of social media um, on happiness um, what she decided to look at her name is Erica she decided to ask the question to what extent given that it's so easy to be a fake person on Facebook, does it help or hurt you or do nothing? And so everybody knows, you know, the famous data from, you know, that Cambridge Analytics uh, stole from Facebook, et cetera, and who knows what the truth is there. But anyway, so we have access to that data. 
And so we have access to millions of people, over about five million people. And we know how they rated themselves privately on the big five personality test. How agreeable, how extroverted or introverted, how emotionally stable, how conscientious, etc. We also know how their friends rated them on those same personality traits. So that's a separate, independently taken measure. We also ha can use, uh, I don't know anymore what I'm supposed to call it, AI, which is artificial or augmented or applied, but whatever. <laughs> we use whatever that is, the algorithm. Um, and on, with the algorithm, we applied it to their Facebook posting, which also does a personality analysis. And then we also use the algorithm applied to their likes. Right? And so in each of these cases, we now have four different measures of the person's personality mm -hmm. scores. And what we also have is this individual's happiness levels. And what we find is that when people are seen to be the same as the way they themselves report themselves as being, mm -hmm. they're happier. Now, these individuals don't know how the algorithm is going to report it, so it's not like they can curate that. They are making the choice. You know, I'm introverted, and somehow they're acting in accordance with that so that the, the Facebook algorithm sees them as introverted and their friends see them as introverted. Because if any one of these are misaligned, then we do see a drop in subjective well-being. So I'll stop there. Interesting. Okay, Ataka-san. <laughs> okay. Um, since I'm not a, such a great storyteller, uh, let me talk basically on uh, just facts or on some logical stuff. Uh, there are two couple of thi two things uh, that's going to happen in the near future, leveraging technology. I think the one thing is the most tedious stuff will be automated like an identification or the classification of things or the prediction of the, her behavior or something of the five million people at the same time or, the, or doing the, some basic task such as driving and uh, very clear objective stuff. And that's one thing. And second uh, change will happen um, something related to the relationship comments we will get, or we can get connected to the to each person, any group, anytime, anywhere. That's a two big change. And uh, um, so, uh, based on that, a person's role um, will probably mainly be much more on uh, perceiving. I mean, the judging the quality or the uh, meaning of the things or the situation, or her uh, uh, deciding. Uh, based on the uh, criteria her each one has, or uh, each group has, or uh, communicating things, e uh, including the translation of their her ideas that came out from machines uh, called AI or a uh, data center or anything. Uh, so we have to uh, do something like that. That's uh, probably the main things we will do. So it's a kind of journey back to ourselves and uh, humanity and stuff will be restored, I think. And uh, uh, based on those technologies, we will likely start to work on uh, multiple works at the same time, five, 10, or something like that. I, I even myself is working on at least or four or five things, uh, different organizations at the same time. And uh, probably that's gonna happen in uh, every, everyone in the near future. And uh, um, so we will be released from a certain company, for sure, right? So in a sense, life will be colorful. And uh, we don't have to get tired of doing the same thing again, 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 day after day, next month, next, next year. That kind of stuff will stop anymore. We don't have to worry about it. Um, so uh, that uh, um, basic change that's going to happen. And I think, um, well, minimum comfort is, of course, important. However, 
probably the most important uh, happiness of the world will come from the fact that we can feel we are valuable to the society or the community or the group or the some people around you. So whenever you can feel you are of something to the group or the, uh, some, some part of it, you will probably feel uh, happy uh, and uh, you can be a happy worker and a happy professional. So how uh, you have to feel the value you are delivering. So that's a uh, uh, basic thing, but uh, it tend to be ignored recently on uh, even at this moment. Uh, so that will be very important. So we will um, probably no more measure happiness simply by delivering the number to the company or some business. Uh, rather, we would feel happiness uh, probably from the direct feedback from the people around you or uh, even uh, people not around you but uh, you are connected via the, <laughs> those network. You can feel even from, uh, say, Brazil, at the opposite side of the planet, but it's okay if you can get connected. Uh, probably in Brazil, it's uh, three in the morning, and uh, even in uh, China's home, it's three in the morning, but uh, it's okay. And if, as long as you get connected, you can feel you are delivering some happiness to someone, and uh, you feel the happiness based on that. That's uh, probably basic stuff that will happen for the future of the work and happiness from the work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, nowadays, yeah. there are a lot of, you know, materials and goods and services and gadgets and technologies. So more and more goods, more and more you know, products and services, but more people get depressed. More people suicide. Too much so connections. Too so connections. how can we you know, change this trend? Do you think any effective way to you know, change this way. Maybe we need to change something. I do think we have to be careful about the fact that we're getting a little too small data happy. So I, th I think we, obviously, it can be helpful to measure my every single footstep that I took in a day and every single calorie and how much I sweat and how many how many moments of good sleep I got, and I mean, I could go on and on and on, but our capacity today to collect our data on ourselves is incredible. And while that's a really useful thing in that if I have a particular problem that I'm trying to solve, it can be really helpful. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to lose weight, okay, these are some aids that can help me. If I'm, you know, trying to improve my sleep, there are some aids that can help me. However, if you try to maximize on every single one of these things and at the same time attempt to lead a normal life, no wonder you're going to be stressed. I mean, it's stressful to maximize on all these things. So you're going to have to be choosy about which things are really more important to focus on, and you're going to have to just l start letting things go. In the old days, you didn't have to make the decision of letting things go because you didn't have these kinds of choices. Your parents didn't have these kinds of choices. You just followed the norms. Today, you actually have to consciously say, no, that's not a choice worth making or having. And that's hard for people. So, but, uh, I guess we will have exponentially growing choices, even in the future. How, what, what do you think is the best way to handle those um, complexity? I mean, I've always been a big fan of limiting your choices. And, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of going after lots and lots of choice. I, I think that if it really matters to you, then you either look to see if somebody else created the choice or you create one that's a meaningful choice. However, most of the time, uh, I really think you just, you don't, you know, on most things throughout your day, you really should just go with the default. It's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. At least that's my opinion. Any? 
Yeah, I completely agree with what Shina said. Shina also um, shared some, um, you know, research that Facebook thing that also tells a lot of great thing. Uh, what I want to say to to Yano-san's question, what what the best way uh, for us to avoid the current situation, which is I would like to say, um, we have to focus more on ourselves. We tend to focus on others. We tend to focus on things that we need to do. So our consciousness is always expanding and then going outside, but not inside. So this is, I think, related to the concept of mindfulness. So our mind is always full. Mind is full. It's different, for, different from mindful. So. If we can take care of ourselves much more uh, kindly, take more time to think about ourselves. For example, uh, Shina said the meaningful choice. I really think the meaning is one of the key word. What matters to me? What's the best thing for me? So I don't know to how many people, about you know people here always think about the self. What kind of uh, you know time do you have every day? How long do you take only on your own? Um, sometimes because we are too busy, to paying attention to many things. Sometimes some people say uh, bathroom is the only place that he he or she can be alone and then concentrate on the self. I think uh, we can increase that kind of time. I believe it will create some changes, positive changes. So on that note, um, you know, right now, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of choice and we have a lot of information. It, it turns out that every time you s interrupt yourself because of a text or an email, et cetera, it takes at least 15 to 20 minutes before you can get back on track. And, and this isn't true of just men or women. It's actually true of all of us. Um, even though we like to think that women are better at multitasking, and I haven't figured out whether men convinced women of this or women just uh, <laughs> women just somehow felt this gave them more power. But the truth of the matter is that women are not any better at multitasking than our men, and the error rates when you multitask actually go up by threefold. Um, the third thing I wanted to point out is that when you have a day filled with meetings, which I know everybody here in the room does, when you do meeting, 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 and you're switching topics, you're actually cognitively depleting yourself. Right. So if you're going to do that, you have to build in a break mm -hmm. in between the meetings. Mm -hmm. And so one very useful thing to what she was just saying, Yuka was, Yuka-san was just saying, um, is you have to build in that 15 to 20 minute just meditative state because otherwise your brain will not cognitively perform well to just switch topics cold like that. You have to clear the mind before you go to the next topic. Um, and same thing is true when I'm talking about multitasking, when I'm talking about the other things you really need to make sure that you understand that your brain is not going to be functioning at this speed level that you're expecting it to. You got to give it breaks. Okay, I'm yeah. Well, um, the, all all those uh, wisdoms are uh, really great, and uh, I agree. And um, if I could add some points, in in, in addition to the uh, controlling the jacking in frequency to the network. Uh, and as suggested by Sina, her I would suggest to have a ten to fifteen minutes nap. Uh, it, it really works for me, and just having a nap on a desk might seem you are not diligent. Actually, that's a sign of diligence. <laughs> Actually, you are a hard worker, and you need a nap. So that's one thing. And, uh, and uh, for me, uh, having uh, my favorite drink, actually, the Coke Zero is really critical. Uh, th this really does calibrate myself to the point where I am <laughs> all the time. So you need to have... Are you paid by Pepsi? No, I'm, uh, I'm uh, almost a junkie of this drink. 
<laughs> and drinking maybe a thousand bottles a year for 25 years. <laughs> and nothing has changed, and it really helped me. So you need to have something to calibrate yourself to the way you are. So that's the one thing. And uh, regarding the choices, yeah, we are facing the increasing number of choices because we are doing so many, many things. But the fortunately, uh, uh, by the development of a new technology, uh, like uh, by the person like Yano-san, uh, we don't have to worry about the tedious things anymore. We can let machines to decide on the most uh, typical things. We just can focus on abnormal things only. Uh, so that the let machine decide as much as possible, and uh, we will just focus on uh, her some key things. So that's uh, how one how big a uh, point of the work for in the near future, and uh, also her rather than focusing on the time we are investing on the rather than the effort you are investing, we should rather much more focus on the changes we are delivering. That is a much more. Uh, output-driven society rather than the uh, pain, pain-driven society or an effort-driven society. And uh, until probably even at the time of 2019, this year, Japan's most working places are measuring the effort simply by the time spent. That kind of the uh, ridiculous situation should be completely changed by the power of the G1 group people, uh, <laughs> including you guys. So we have to change it. And uh, if we can measure the output value uh, rather than time, that will radically liberate ourselves. Say, for instance, uh, there is a uh, professional who can really be good at uh, uh, cracking the, her, what is that, hard share of the chestnut, kurumi, uh, or uh, even a kuri, those kind of stuff, marrons. And uh, it, there, is, there are some professors in, uh, uh, I don't know the real English name, Daire in China. Uh, they can pick uh, 100 kuri for a minute. But I tried it once, but it took me 20 seconds, and only the nasty kuri came out. From <laughs> but the, uh, as long as I've seen a professional work in the China, China, northern part of China, uh, they are really good, and pretty, pretty 100 curry for a minute. So her, the number of the curry does matter, uh, it, but the time spent doesn't matter. That kind of the application should be uh, done for any kind of work. That's really important, I think. Uh, another, um, actually, uh, recently I've uh, discovered some, uh, encountered a very interesting work uh, on happiness um, called nature connectedness. So if you feel as a part of a nature, that has tremendous impact on your happiness. That's quite interesting, especially the amount of, uh, for example, green or plants, that's not relevant. Actually, it is relevant that you are part of the nature. And so paying it, you know, what, how much you put attention to be a part or belonging to nature has tremendous impact on your happiness level. That's a quite interesting. And especially, and also, it is quite, um, gives us hope because we don't need tremendous investment to make that happen. Just tiny change in how, where you put your attention gives tremendous impact on your happiness. But of course, that might be help, helped by the technology. And so I think it's a quite, there are a lot of you know, degree of freedom in our society or you know, living that we can change small amount of things. I agree. Yeah, if you have an, uh, your secret forest around your working place, that will change your life. And actually, I have one, and I haven't told it because uh, I didn't want many of my colleagues to gather to the forest. Then uh, my secret place will be devastated. But <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that really works. Can I ask one question regarding the nature connectedness? I, I, um, I feel it's very 
important thing uh, for me as well. If I feel I'm in the nature and I'm a part of the nature, um, I feel the more happiness and I feel like I, I became a bigger, um, like in a wider. So I understand that. And then my question is, if we can utilize technology and then, for example, the, uh, using this room, creating the environment, utilizing technology, and then on the wall, uh, we see the nature as if we are in the big forest. Is it working? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we can do experiments. And uh, or even, but I think a very tiny intervention, like um, just in the morning, you're up on the phone. Mm, we'll ask right. you, do you think you're um, a part of nature? Mm -hmm. Just you know, putting your attention uh, to some something which you don't put your attention is uh, gives tremendous impact. Actually, we we are creating uh, an app that's put such a micro, mm -hmm. micro intervention every day morning. Um, what kind of, you know, things you will like to do today? Pick up one of these challenges or menus. You can pick one of them or create your own. Mm -hmm. And uh, user use that app and uh, more, more than sev 7,000 of menus or challenges or ha have already been created by the users. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, um, Clearly, um, the users from very wide variety of companies and organizations, just one month of daily tiny micro intervention, their psychological capital, that's a one of um, measure of uh, um, happiness, very sustainable happiness level is very consistently improved significantly. And so, I think uh, there are many ways. Uh, that's just one uh, starting point. But we can do a lot of experiment, especially with this infrastructure, uh, smartphone, wearable. And, and uh, that's, I think uh, it's interesting because you know, some academic research might be integrated with those you know, technology platform, just like you know, Sheena said, uh, using Facebook data to discover that's, you know, alignment with your, uh, um, what you understand your personality and what others think about it. Shina, do you, oh. Yeah. Um, well, this isn't about technology exactly in, a, in the way you're talking about, but I'm reminded of, there's a pretty well-known um, writer in the US, his name is Charles Eisenstein. And uh, he's kind of like a uh, Yuval Harara writer. So he, re he wrote a book that's very well regarded called The Ascent of Humanity. Um, and, uh, and he continues to write his lots of books now. He's writing on environmental policy and pol how to save politics, et cetera. But one of the things that I found particularly interesting in his treatise on what's happening to humanity today uh, is that he essentially argues that what has made us less and less happy in the modern world is the fact that we lost our sense of interdependence. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because, you know, at least in the West, we first got really interested in the notion of interdependence because of Japan. It was in the 1980s because Americans were looking closely at why were these Japanese companies beating American companies. And so there became, there became an awareness of looking at comparing this notion of interdependence, which was the Japanese way, and the notion of independence, which was seen as the American way. Now what's happened, if you think about it, in the last 40 years, is there's essentially been a rise of independence the globe over because that's what essentially these that technology choice explosion information explosion does no matter where you go it there's essentially a push towards customization individualization you can have literally create your own world today 
what Charles Eisenstein was essentially arguing was in a sense bringing back some of the same elements that actually already existed in many Asian cultures. So he, he said that um, you know, it's when you think that the self is separated from its environment, separated from the other people that it has relationships with, that's when you actually see the rise of unhappiness. And so he actually argued something very similar to what you're saying here, was that essentially you needed to have people more embedded uh, and more in tune with nature mm -hmm. and relationships um, and, and even maybe bring back some concepts that are anti-science. He felt even science was, was creating a rise of individualism. So he felt that things like economics and uh, engaging in experimentation, uh, even though there was no proof behind things like God and astrology, it did make us feel that we were more a part of a larger thing as opposed to cutting, us up, cutting ourselves up into these little slivers and categories. So, I mean, it's an interesting idea. There's no way to prove him right or wrong. <laughs> Do you have any? I'll, can I pick up a different one? Like yeah, yeah, please. That's a lifespan thing. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 as I've seen uh, um, data from the Ministry of Healthcare uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, what uh, su really surprised me is the most frequent death age in Japan now for men is 88, for ladies, 92. Already, it's a uh, statistic of the last year. Okay, and uh, we are already living in the age of 90 years old, and uh, probably we will live. Um, 90 percent of this room people probably live more than 100 years, likely, and uh, that's a uh, that's a future. So, concerning that, and concerning the economy. Uh, Retirement at the age of 65 will not be allowed anymore in the near future. We have to work until the day before the death. <laughs> before the day of the passing away, okay? And uh, um, that really strongly suggests the requirement of the renovation of the skills. Yeah, all right. And uh, we've been seeing the rapid change of the, all the technological landscape. Smartphone appeared just 12 years ago, and uh, it already uh, consists more than 70% of the world of computer shipping, right? right. And the internet has just 20-some uh, years of ages, and uh, without the internet, it doesn't work anymore. So uh, just now one time, or in a second time education is not enough. We have to renew ourselves every 10 or 20 years. Without having that, we will have a very sad uh, afterlife, yeah. right? So, uh, so it will be really critical for everyone to uh, be really uh, who has the willingness to renew uh, themselves and uh, have joy of living uh, by learning or renewing some skills. And that's the one thing I'm, I'm feeling. There's both good news and bad news on aging, right? On the, on the, um, on the good news side, um, even though our bodies deteriorate, on average, the older we get, we're happier. Uh, we tend to know more what we want. We tend to invest more energy doing the things that we want. We're not as distractible. We are also less exploratory of other options. So whereas, you know, young people like to try mm -hmm. out many things, older people tend not to. Mm -hmm. The bad news is that if the in income divide, which may not be as true here probably as it is in the it U.S. True here. Right? Mm -hmm. All right, the, the income divide in the U.S. makes a tremendous difference in what your age, your old age will look like. If you um, are on the lower income bracket, your not, not only will your lifespan be shorter, but your health does deteriorate much faster. It usually starts in the 50s. 
whereas once you're in the upper middle class in the U.S., um, it's, it's tremendous. I mean, their health remains relatively constant and good into their 70s, which is why you have all these old people, relatively old people, doing marathons and triathlons. Um, and this is obviously in large part because of the differences in healthcare opportunities um, and differences in you know, food quality, et cetera. Uh, so you may not have that problem as pronounced here, uh, but that is something that we see in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think it's now time for Q&A. Okay, so one, two, three. I will, you know, take three questions first. Uh, the first one. Hey, well, my name is um, Dorito Dillon from McKinsey. Um, I have a question to Sheena, and I was interested about the research that you were mentioning about social media, self others' perception, or the subjective uh, well-being as well. For these people that might be unhappy because of their self and others' perceptions are different, I guess for these people, when they see your research, they might still don't react, and they will still do the same things as their possible behavior. I wanted to ask you your, your perspective in terms of how could we change the behaviors of these people potentially on social media in order to make them um, happier? Since I can imagine a number of people exist into this category. Okay, the second one. Uh, so what's uh, happening? Uh, just oh, wait. Sorry. Oh yeah, the second question. <laughs> sure. uh, thank you for the panel. My name is Jordan Fisher. I run a startup in Japan called Zehitomo.com. Um, I, I found the thoughts of like the paradox of choice being very interesting, and it, it led to a couple other discussions, particularly around you know how can we measure everything that we are creating uh, from an economic perspective, and how can we optimize for the the value that's being created. Um, coming back to technology and happiness, uh, and without this becoming too philosophical, like have we found any meaningful ways to actually measure happiness and is there a way that we can kind of change our capitalistic structure to optimize our technology developments for that? Thank you. Okay, the, the third one. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Chou Min. I'm working for a uh, private equity fund in Japan and I have one question to uh, Yano-san and Akata-san uh, which is uh, the high tech has uh, uh, very big power, not only uh, from the viewpoint of uh, brighter side, also the uh, darkness side. Like for example, nowadays, uh, like autonomous weapon, or like uh, Terminator thing, and uh, it it happens. So what what kind of view do you have to minimize the magnitude of the sadness from the that kind of high tech? Okay, so Shina, the first one. Um. Okay, let me try to remember. Okay, so let's take up the how do you measure happiness question. Probably the best measure to date is still the one that Dan Gilbert originated, where if you just, you, he actually created the very old fashioned version of the app, but now you have more advanced apps where it just, measure, just asks you a single question how happy are you multiple times a day. It turns out that, well, there's some variance over the course of a day. You, we are, on average, fairly consistent. Um, we're also, on average, fairly consistently affected by similar things that make us more happy and less happy. We don't always, we're not always aware of it, um, but that's probably the most consistent measure, and they've now correlated that also with uh, things like body temperature and other phys physiological measures. Um, in terms of the question that you asked uh, the guy from McKinsey, um, so let's unpack your question. Um, Essentially, when I'm on social media, I have an opportunity to either present myself the way I am or present my way, myself in a way that I think is more socially desirable. And what are the ways in which people try to engage in curation? They're more likely to try to present themselves as more extroverted when they're introverted um, or more open when they're less open-minded. I mean, because it's, it's, a, it's a restricted set of personality traits. And so essentially what you find is that when people is, pretend to be that which they're not, meaning, let's say, extroverted when I'm actually introverted, that's when you see the decrements in um, happiness. And it's probably because, you know, to post, let's think about the study, to you're an introvert and you're trying to present yourself as an extrovert, and so you're creating content for your Facebook that maybe shows you're at a party a lot, um, that probably feels a bit awkward, and you're probably also having to go to parties that you don't want to go to. And so now your question is, how do you change that? 
Um, I mean, I, I think we all, to some extent, learn to change that comes with maturity. But you know, anybody that has a young person, like a teenager, oh my God, those guys, if anything, social media has made us even more obsessed with what other people think, right? Because you, anytime you post anything on Snapchat or Instagram, you immediately see how many people liked it. And if they didn't, and if you got no likes, I mean, God forbid, you might just be ordinary for five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other um, answer or comments? Did I yeah. answer your question? Yeah, one thing regarding the how to measure the happiness, um, on top of what Shina said, um, uh, one um, direction that I feel I know uh, happening in Japan is uh, learning from the positive psychology. There is the five dimension that we always pay attention to see whether uh, we have the high um, score or high level of um, well-being. So by the way, happiness and well-being are a little bit different. So uh, we also be paying attention, being paying attention to that word itself. Happiness is the emotion that you can feel at this moment, happy and happy. Uh, they can be really up and down, so kind of every day, every moment thing. But a well-being is much more longer span. So what positive psychology tells is uh, the person who have the longer term of well-being, um, higher level of well-being, they, those people will be um, longer life. Uh, performance is good, resilience is stronger, those kind of things. So um, five dimension for the, um, the good well-being is P-E-R-M-A, so PERMA we call. So that's the, uh, the P representing the positive emotions. So people who have the more positive emotions have a tendency to have the, the better uh, well-being. E, engagement. R, relationship, M, meaning, and A, accomplishment. So how we can um, scale each PERMA, uh, what to do, how to do, that is the big discussion I have at this moment with the people based in Japan, also have some support from the US, and Ayano-san is also one of them. So we haven't done yet something, you know, one, one thing that can um, scale PERMA everything, but we can utilize the, um, some questionnaire or uh, the plans to utilize Facebook or Twitter, uh, utilize the technology. So those kind of things, we are still thinking. We are still, uh, the, the project is still going on. But going forward, uh, within a year, we would like to create something like that. Mm. One thing I want to just add to what she's saying is that there's a lot of research that shows the importance of relationships, and there's no doubt about that. But I do think that with the advent of technology, all of us need to pay more attention to asking ourselves the question of what is a meaningful relationship look like today? And I don't mean that to be a purely negative thing. Um, a lot of people will say, oh my god, all these people that have these one-off texts and they even sext and they do all these kinds of things that they don't even see each other ever in person, isn't that a meaningless relationship? Not exactly. There are some people that that does become a meaningful form of relationship because it serves a, p a really important function. And for example, in the old days, we used to have the, the pen pal, right? The person that wrote letters back and forth, and yeah. that could be a really intense relationship. Um, the, the thing is, though, that in the modern day, because you can have so many, you can literally be in contact with hundreds of people, maybe even thousands of people per day, depending on how many people are you're connected to on Facebook and Twitter and through these texts. Mm -hmm. I think each of us as individuals need to pay more attention to, well, which relationships are actually meaningful in terms of adding value to my overall life versus which ones are simply becoming a kind of addiction because I want connection, I'm not really getting connection, so I'm just sort of settling for whatever it is that I'm getting because it's still giving me a temporary high. And I don't think we're at a point right now where we're sophisticated enough to really be paying attention to ourselves and how we're responding because we're all just very quickly reacting to whatever is happening to us on that text. Okay. Difficult question. 
Dark side. Uh, uh, dark side, <laughs> yeah. Dark side, more, more, more. Yeah, yeah, other, uh, let me pick two points on uh, measuring and the uh, dark side. Um, measuring stuff, well, uh, it's really difficult because uh, real fulfillment comes only after we tried hard and we can really feel the change we are doing. You can really get the real feedback, right? And uh, so uh, seemingly only when we are really devastated or really exhausted, we are really deeply happy. That's a real big pro problem. Also, the frequency of the difference of the uh, change, what you made, is also does matter. If you are the first time uh, achiever of the merger and acquisition, the first time happiness is really great. Probably, but if you do it every, say, three months, that is tiny, right? So uh, that is also very difficult. However, regarding the mind state, just measuring the EEG or the just a simple home measuring of the behavior, right? Uh, using the Yanosan's device, you can measure the basic level of happiness. So uh, technically speaking, you can measure it. But uh, we cannot measure how deep it is and why it is that happy. That's the first point. Uh, regarding the dark side question, autonomous weapon, uh, that actually we've been discussing a lot, even in the her government side, and uh, that's a really big topic. So, um, well, there's a word uh, which is how much people are involved in those uh, technical weapons. Uh, you're, if you uh, are humans are in the loop, or the on the loop, or the out of the loop, of the decision, okay, and uh, if if the mas uh, we are out of the loop and the machine to machine uh, weapons, can, we cannot intervene. It, it's, it's too rapid, and we cannot uh, even see what's really going on, and we will see the result in five minutes or something, and uh, so that kind of stuff should not happen. So what what's being discussed in the global um, defense side discussion, I, as far as I know, is we have to at least, I mean, human beings have to be at least on the loop, uh, hopefully in the loop of the decisions, but not really sure what uh, is, is really possible or not. So the one thing we really have to figure out is for her making, uh, we cannot probably stop the autonomous weapon, However, we can at least make sure we can have the rebooting or the stopping button. Yeah, if we do not have it, probably that's gonna be a big mess. So uh, we have to have the way to in forcefully intervene and uh, stop it. Uh, and the, the, the we don't know how to do it at this moment. But you just can plug out the, uh, if it's just not one, one single machine, but if there's millions of it uh, running based on a battery like this, you cannot do it, right? So uh, we don't know how to do it, but now we, uh, we have to figure it out. That's one big, big discussion, yeah. Okay, I think um, it's almost uh, run out of time. Um, Finally, I'd like to uh, add, so uh, I think the meaning of the happiness or well-being is quite diversified. And uh, we have, uh, in the last uh, months, we had a very big di discussion, the meaning and definition of well-being and happiness. Uh, actually, the word used for happiness or well-being in every culture is quite diversified and different. Uh, for example, um, in Germany, there is, I heard there's no word that is directly corresponding to happiness. And they use Glück. It's more like luck in English. And uh, in Finland, um, they use Sisu. Sisu is more like strong courage or strength to difficult problems. And um, like, uh, you know, Japanese, you know, it's quite, you know, Showa style uh, mindset. And uh, Japanese, shiawase. Shiawase is just, Shina said, shia, it's the same origin with shiai, the game match. So interdependence 
is the shell, Japanese way of shell set. So any variety of all these are quite a global uh, concept of shell uh, happiness. And uh, now it's time to um, explore, you know, real meaning and during uh, um, using these kind of opportunities. And thank you for all great panelists and uh, for audience. So big applause. <laughs>